All right. Uh, good morning and welcome to day two of Wisconsin Water Week. Uh, my name is Luke Wynn and I will be the moderator for this morning's fisheries section. Um, I'm very excited to be here this morning. I very intentionally selected this morning's topic based purely on personal interest. Um, and we will be hearing from four amazing speakers today on the topic of Wisconsin fisheries. So I encourage everyone to uh, review the agenda or the timeline and kind of be aware of those start times. Um, we do have a few breaks scheduled throughout the morning, um, but we will have a presentation at 8.30 right now. Um, we'll have one at 9 a.m. from Mike D'Onofrio, 10 a.m. from Brad Sims, and 11 a.m. from Dr. John Lyons. So make sure to uh, tune into those at the right time when you can. So um, I want to take a brief moment to recognize the incredible work of the UW Extension Lakes team. Um, they have done just an incredible job preparing for a truly jam-packed week. Uh, the logistics alone to host over 250 speakers, over a thousand attendees over the course of the week is truly remarkable. Um, just talking with our host early, I think we, the, the word colossal was thrown out, thrown out there. So truly an amazing job by that team. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, um, I just want to cover the really the one housekeeping item. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A, uh, the Q&A uh, section of the EventMobi platform. Um, that is where I'll be monitoring for questions. Um, and as viewers, you actually have the ability to vote on your favorite or most pertinent questions. Um, and that's how I'm going to prioritize which questions to ask as time allows, because we will have a, a, a tight timeline. So uh, make sure to use that Q&A to, to send in your questions. Um, and with that, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker of the morning. Um, this morning, Holly Imke will be uh, talking to us. She is a fourth year PhD candidate at UW-Madison, working on uh, recreational fisheries and kind of food web management. Um, Today, she will specifically be talking about uh, the food web response, as you can see on the, the screen here, uh, to whole lake bass and sunfish removal. So Holly, you are more than welcome to take it away. All right, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for having me today um, to uh, speak about a project that uh, we've been working on uh, for quite a while. This is our, this is a long-term project. So this is our fourth year um, of collecting data and I'll go into a lot more detail, but because this is such a large scale project, I wanna take a moment to recognize all of our collaborators um, on this project who are highly critical and would not, this project would not be possible without them. And so not only do we have collaborators at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, but there are also a group of collaborators at UW-Stevens Point and USGS and Wisconsin DNR that um, play a vital role in, in ensuring that this project um, continues and uh, even exists in the first place. So um, as Luke mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about um, a, this whole lake bass and sunfish removal project that we've been working on um, to assess how um, removing bass and sunfish uh, affects uh, walleye and other fish and the ecosystem as a whole. Okay. So to give you a bit of background about why we're doing this large scale uh, bass and sunfish removal in a northern Wisconsin lake, um, it stems from this idea of, of emphasizing and focusing on walleye. So as I'm sure many folks are aware, walleye are this highly valuable local inland fishery in Wisconsin and throughout their native um, range in North Central North America, where they provide many ecological, economic, and cultural benefits to large groups of people. But walleye recruitment and production have been shown to be declining, especially over the past 10 to 15 years. And much of those uh, that work and those trends have been established to be occurring in um, the ceded territory or the northern third of Wisconsin. And so a lot of work has been focused on trying to understand why walleye are declining. Um, and a lot of that uh, work has focused on large scale climatic drivers. So focusing on things like increasing um, air and water temperatures, 
and how that affects lakes, as well as shifting ice cover and ice duration, as well as um, shifting water level and how that affects lakes. And all of those large scale climatic drivers um, come together to then affect local lake habitats and changing lake habitat characteristics. And so as a result of those large scale climatic drivers, lake habitats are also changing. So we're seeing shifts in thermal conditions, so temperature and lake stratification patterns and water clarity, as well as conditions for invasive species, which also affect those things. And so as a result, a lot of work has also emphasized this interplay between thermal optical habitat or um, uh, temperature and light and how temperature and light come together to create these, this optimal habitat for walleye and how that has been shifting over time and really declining in certain lakes um, and become really limiting for walleye and that's of concern. And of course, climate doesn't just affect walleye. Um, at the same time that cool water species like walleye are declining because of, potentially because of these large scale drivers, um, other species are shifting in other ways as well. And so at the same time that cool water species like walleye are declining, warm water species um, have been shown to increase. So bass and sunfish species um, at the same time that walleye decline have been shown to be increasing. And so it's a little uncertain as to how um, these new species assemblages um, are interacting to result, to contribute to walleye declines. And as I mentioned, walleye are this um, very important fishery. And so harvest and fishing also contributes to walleye declines. So all of these factors come together to contribute to walleye declines um, in a bunch of different ways. But one thing that's a little bit uncertain, like I mentioned, is how these different species assemblages really contribute specifically to walleye declines. And so that's something that we're very interested in figuring out. So in order to understand how um, increasing bass and sunfish influence uh, declining walleye, we are conducting this whole lake bass and sunfish removal to specifically ask, can we increase walleye by removing these warm water predators and competitors? And so this is a project that we started in 2017 um, by collecting baseline data on our uh, experimental and reference system. And I'm gonna go into a bunch more detail in a second on this, but just to give you an overview. Um, collected baseline data in 2017, and then began removing fish from our experimental lake in 2018 and have continued removing fish um, in, the, in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So to give you an idea of where these uh, lakes are in the landscape, um, this is Northern Wisconsin. So uh, I'm down here in Madison right now, um, but these lakes are up here in Iron County in Northern Wisconsin. Um, our experimental lake is called McDermott Lake. It's quite close to the Turtle Flambeau flowage, if folks are familiar. Um, and then our reference lake is nearby called Sandy Beach Lake. Um, and when I say experimental, I just mean, oops. Uh, and when I say experimental, I just mean McDermott Lake is the lake that we are pulling fish out of. And uh, Sandy Beach, our reference system, we're not pulling any fish out of, but we're measuring the same um, variables in um, throughout this experiment. All right, and McDermott Lake and Sandy Beach Lake, our experimental and reference systems are very similar in their conditions. They're both around 100 acres. They have um, max depths from three to five meters, um, mean depths from two to three meters. Um, and similar habitat structures. Although Sandy Beach is more of a sand bowl as the name um, uh, states. Um, and they have similar natural histories where they both uh, historically had um, uh, presence of natural walleye recruitment and uh, currently, or at least prior to the experiment beginning in 2017, had no evidence of natural walleye recruitment or no, um, and uh, have also seen these concurrent increases in warm water fish species like bass and sunfishes. So um, to understand how 
the fish community and the invertebrate community um, is shifting throughout this experiment. We really wanted to understand how um, fish of all sizes, all ages, of all species um, are affected by pulling bass and sunfish out, not just walleye, although we are very interested in um, all life stages of walleye. So it kind of takes all survey methods. And so in 2017, we established the standardized survey approach where um, we, uh, and then we've continued this standardized survey approach um, in every year since. And then on top of this, we remove fish. So to give you an idea of what our summers look like, we oops, begin the summer by um, conducting population estimates to get an idea of what the walleye and largemouth bass population sizes are in both our experimental and reference systems. We then conduct um, fish community surveys um, using boat electrofishing, clover leaf traps, and mini fike nets to understand what the other species within the fish community um, are doing. And then, um, as I mentioned, we're very interested in early life stages of walleye. And so we conduct age zero walleye surveys rather continuously throughout the summer um, using a variety of gears. We're also interested in other trophic levels, so other parts of the food web. Um, specifically, as I'm going to talk about today, um, we measure zooplankton a bunch of times throughout the summer, and then we also um, sample the zoobenthos community, so the nearshore bug community, um, multiple times throughout the summer. And so on top of these methods, in McDermott Lake beginning in 2018, we started removing bass and sunfish species from um, our experimental lake using a variety of gears, basically fike nets, boat electrofishing, clover leaf traps, and mini fike nets. And so rather continuously throughout the summer, we are pulling fish out of the lake um, on top of these standardized surveys. Okay, so then during our surveys, I'm gonna um, uh, move through this rather quickly, but um, during our surveys, we subsample a group of individuals to collect um, some fish demography information because we want to be able to kind of understand not only how um, the number of fish are changing through over the course of this experiment, but also other characteristics like how um, large individuals are, how old they are, um, and how, yeah, these different metrics um, come. Uh, change over time. And so for each species, like in your combination, I'm just going to show you a couple of, um, of relevant uh, fish demographics that we collect and how that relates to the metrics I'm going to talk about today. So we collect total length, weight, age, and maturity for um, each species um, during each lake in year. Um, and then using total length and weight, we develop length weight relationships, which we then use to calculate biomass um, for each species. We then use total length and age um, to develop age length keys and total length and maturity to um, establish size at maturity thresholds to then designate adult, juvenile, and age zero catch per unit effort and biomass per unit effort. Um, so then we're not just thinking about fish, the fish species as um, kind of uniform uh, uh, populations, but as kind of more age specific uh, groups. All right, so to get into some of the results of what we found so far, I'm going to run through a bunch of plots and they're going to be quite similar. Um, but the first one I want to show you is this plot here. We've got X uh, or on the X axis, we've got year. And on the y axis, we have fishes removed in the left plot. Um, I'm gonna sh it shows the abundance, so just the number of fishes removed. And then in the right plot, it shows um, the biomass removed in kilograms. And then the color indicates um, the species. And so over the course of the three years that we've removed fish, um, we've removed just over 3,000 kilograms, which equates to about 7,000 pounds of fish. Um, and about 215,000 individuals. They've been, those removals have been comprised of about seven species and have been heavily dominated by bluegill. Um, and 
as you can see also, the uh, our removals both in abundance and biomass have really declined in our most recent year in uh, 2020. And so um, that was comforting news to us. We were able to maintain our sampling effort relatively consistently in 2020, even though um, we hit some barriers with COVID and the pandemic, but um, that wasn't necessarily a factor that played into this. And so we feel that we've potentially hit, um, uh, we're potentially starting to make a real dent in these populations with our removals. All right, okay, so diving into some other results here. Um, again, these plots are gonna be very similar across these slides, um, but to orient you again, we have um, gear on the x-axis and whatever our metric, our um, population metric is gonna be. So in this case, it's the adult population estimate. So number of adults um, in the population. Um, the left panel shows um, the population estimates for McDermott Lake, our experimental system where we're removing fish. And our right plot shows the um, population for um, Sandy Beach, our reference. Um, and then color indicates species. So two, and then these vertical dashed lines indicate when fish removals occurred. You'll notice we have a vertical dashed line in um, corresponding to fish removals in 2018 and 2019. And so although we did remove fish in 2020, this past summer, those fish removals won't be detectable until this upcoming summer. So we're gonna keep monitoring um, to um, assess changes due to that. So for now, we really only have, um, we have four years of data to discuss and two years of post removal data to talk about. So um, to, to begin with, let's focus on this orange line, this largemouth bass population estimate in, in McDermott Lake. Um, it seems to be bouncing around through time, although it is declining in recent years, it's still within that confidence interval. So it's hard to say if that's a significant change. Um, I think only time will tell and we'll have to see um, in the coming years whether the largemouth bass population is truly declining or if it's kind of just bouncing around. Um, you'll notice in Sandy Beach, we do not have a largemouth bass population estimate. That population is really quite small and so we haven't ever been able to um, assess the uh, largemouth bass population in that lake. Bluegill comprise the dominant um, sunfish within that population. Um, okay, and then switching gears to walleye in Sandy Beach, um, our reference system where we're not pulling fish out, you'll notice that walleye are declining. And so Again, this is this system where we're not really doing anything. And so it seems like walleye may be just following the trend, um, the regional trend where um, due to that complex of other factors that walleye are potentially just declining in Sandy Beach as would potentially be expected. In contrast, um, in McDermott Lake, we see an, an increase in walleye. And so we've detected an adult walleye change only in the most recent year in 2020, where in previous years, up until uh, 2020 or up until 2019, we've estimated the population to bounce around between 30 to 40 individuals. And now um, in 2020, we've um, seen an increase um, up to about 120 individuals. Okay, to shift gears outside of walleye and largemouth bass into the rest of the um, adult fish community, um, first in uh, McDermott Lake. And again, I'm gonna just run you through how this plot is oriented. So we have year on the x-axis um, and then our population metrics on the y. So in the first row here, we have catch per unit effort. And in the um, bottom row, we have biomass per unit effort. Um, and then each uh, panel corresponds to a different species. And then the lines and dot color correspond to different gear types that we use to sample. And only statistically significant trends are shown. So only things that are actively changing over time are shown here. So overall, what we've seen are increases or decreases in our dominant centarchid groups in our experimental lake. Um, so black crappie and bluegill and rock bass, um, which is quite, uh, comforting given we put in so much effort to remove those individuals. Um, apart from pumpkin seed, we have started to see a bit of an increase in pumpkin seed over the years, um, 
in our electrofishing gear, um, potentially hinting at some kind of um, compensatory response where um, as we're removing individuals, that population may be um, taking advantage of that additional space and resources and, and um, increasing in their abundance and, and biomass. But the biggest change that we've detected is in the yellow perch um, community. And specifically, we've detected a 3,000% change um, in the yellow perch uh, catch per unit effort. So um, to kind of give you an idea of what that means, in our first year before we were started removing fish from the lake, um, we were catching about a half an, an individual on average per net night um, in our bike nets. And in 2020, most recently, we had um, increased that to about 15 individuals per net night. So that's quite a remarkable increase um, in just a few years for our yellow perch community. Okay, and then shifting also to um, now the adult community, but in our reference system where we're not removing fish, it's the same type of plot. We are also detecting increases in the bluegill population. Um, which again, that would be relatively expected based off of those regional patterns where we're seeing declines in walleye and increases in centrarchids. Bluegills are the um, dominant sunfish in, in, um, our, in Sandy Beach, our reference system. But we've also detected a change in yellow perch. Um, and specifically in our catch per unit effort, we've seen a 300% increase so that shift has been from about one individual to four individuals per net night. Um, so an increase similar like McDermott, our experimental system, but not nearly the same magnitude. Um, and so it's something interesting, um, I think, but and something we'll keep an eye on, but definitely not the same magnitude as our experimental system. Okay, to shift gears again, um, now we're back to McDermott Lake um, and we're back to the juvenile population. So now not the adult population, but the youngsters. Um, and we've just added another gear type here, the cloverleaf trap, which samples real small fish. And it kind of, the juvenile community seems to be following suit with the adult community where we're overall seeing these declines in our centrarchid groups. Um, except for largemouth bass, um, where we're seeing these um, slight increases. Again, I think potentially hinting at that um, compensatory response where with this opening up of um, uh, potential resources and space because we're removing all these fish, we may be getting increased uh, um, numbers of certain species like largemouth bass. So something we're gonna assess a bit further. Okay, and then now to trans, to jump over to outside of the fish community to the other parts of the food web. Um, we also look at the, looked at the um, zooplankton community and um, have seen some pretty uh, interesting declines in the zooplankton community in our experimental system. And there were no um, significant changes in the zooplankton population in um, our reference lake, Sandy Beach Lake. So most notably in the calanoid, cyclopoid, and daphnia populations in um, McDermott Lake, we've seen declines over time. And then in our zoobenthos um, population, we've started to see increases. Um, and so that's, again, that near shore um, bug community that hangs out on the, on the um, ground. Um, we're starting to see increases in coronamids, so midge larvae and ephemeroptera mayfi mayfly larvae, um, and gastropods. So um, in McDermott Lake, those are mostly just snails. Um, so declines in zooplankton and increases in zoobenthos. So, so far, what have we learned in this experiment four years in? Um, we haven't detected any evidence of natural walleye recruitment in either lake. Um, Sandy Beach, our reference system, seems to be following um, the regional trends where we've seen declines in walleye and increases in our um, uh, bluegill community, our sunfish community, and, um, but there is an interest, potentially an interesting thing going on there with the yellow perch um, population where we're seeing some slight changes there, and so something we're definitely going to keep an eye on. 
in McDermott Lake, our experimental system, we're seeing, we're finally seeing some um, declines in centrarchids in our um, bass and sunfishes um, and increases in adult walleye um, and the yellow perch population um, as a whole. Um, I should mention walleye have been supplemented by stocking for in both Sandy Beach and McDermott Lake in 2017 and 2019. Um, and so at least in McDermott Lake, it seems that those um, uh, stocked individuals are likely the ones contributing to that adult population um, that we're now detecting. And so um, although we haven't detected any natural walleye recruitment, our adult population seems to be increasing likely due to the effect of stocking. And then we are seeing some hints of a um, centricate or bass sunfish um, compensatory response um, where uh, this removal and opening up of um, space and resources um, has potentially caused some species to like pumpkin seed and largemouth bass to accelerate their um, growth and increase in abundance. Um, so something we're going to dig into a little bit more. And then we've also started to see these really interesting shifting energy resources in the lake where we're starting to see this decline in zooplankton. So the decline in kind of pelagic resources um, in the open water areas of the lake um, and an increase in zoobenthos, this near shore um, bottom driven um, area of the lake, potentially because of the fish community where we're seeing increased um, planktivory, so increased um, eating of, of zooplankton by fish like yellow perch um, with the opening up of littoral resources so that near shore um, fish community or near shore community um, from the declining bass and sunfish. And so we're planned to um, continue actually removing fish from McDermott Lake and monitoring both lakes for changes in 2021, this upcoming summer. So with that, um, thank you so much for your time and attention and um, I can take any questions. We also have a project website um, that's a bit out of date, but hoping to update it. Um, but if you have, want more information, you can visit, but shoot me an email as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Holly, very much. Um, if you do have a question, make sure to send that into the chat. We've probably got time for maybe just one question. Um, Yes, so Holly, um, are there any differences between the two lakes um, or changes over the course of the experiment uh, in nutrient concentrations or algal populations? Um, maybe interested in given uh, the zooplankton responses in the experimental lake. Yeah, that's a great question. So we are measuring, um, we aren't going, we aren't diving too deep into like the um, phytoplankton communities or algal communities, um, but we are measuring kind of baseline chlorophyll A concentrations and nutrient concentrations. And we haven't detected any significant changes um, through last summer. Um, I think that upcoming this summer and as kind of things start to take hold of these effects, we may start to see some shifts. We have seen um, some trends in water clarity, so sucky depth, um, where that, that lines up with the zooplankton, although it didn't pan out to be statistically significant, but um, to the eye, you can see the trend, I guess, um, where the lake seems to be getting um, uh, less clear, basically. So declines in zooplankton leading to less clarity. Excellent. All right. Mm -hmm. We've got maybe one more we can squeeze in here that a couple of people have voted on. Um, Holly, why would there be walleye stocking during the time frame of the analysis? Is that going to cause any issues um, with your analysis to, to account for that stocking in your study? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, we specifically wanted to do this experiment within the context of kind of normal man a normal management regime. Um, and so tons and tons of lakes within Wisconsin are stocked with walleye and that's a very common practice, especially with a lake, lakes like McDermott and Sandy Beach that do not have natural recruitment happening anymore. Um, and so that's how lakes kind of management exists. And so we basically wanted to conduct this experiment um, without changing the management regime. Um, and so that was 
um, our intention. Um, I think you could certainly make the argument to do uh, an experiment in a different way. Um, but our intention was to try to align the experiment with how management practices are currently done. Excellent. Well, that is our time there, Holly. Thank you so much for yeah. uh, sharing your knowledge with us. It's very interesting to see what type of other management tools we can explore to manage our, our, our fish population. So thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for the questions uh, to the people that asked us questions. Really appreciate it. Um, we're actually going to just kind of move right on in to the next presentation. Um, I want to introduce our next